you want to talk about first how we came up with the idea for doing this, Sandy? You came up with the idea. I, I'm guilty. So this idea came out of the fact that I like to, I mean, usually I talk to Sandy about all stuff called Cthulhu, but it took like about 20 years to realize how influential he was in creating Glorantha together with Greg, so I started switching my focus of interest during the car rides we have together to asking him things about Glorantha and Boomcast and stuff like that. So Sandy and Greg had a very interesting creative process that he might want to talk about or not in this case, but um, it was always very fascinating to, to see how they were creating things for Glorantha and I'm, I'm specifically thinking about the stuff that we encountered in the material that came out in the 80s and the 90s. If you remember the little box text in Jenna Taylor, the hero was coming, all these things you read and wanted to get into your own game. And so, so, so there's a whole slide of things that are super interesting and were like starting point and I quizzed Sandy about it and out of that came the idea why not talk about how they back in the day made Lorenta fun, you know, like all these things, the ducks, you know, the Quark John, then there's you know the, the drop shop and the troll drinks and, and all these things. So I in sense that sure I can talk about that. And so I I think it's a fun it would be a fun, another mining expedition in Sandy's mind, like what we did with Forgotten Secrets of, of Gralantha and more Forgotten Secrets of Gralantha. So, thanks for doing it, Sandy. Okay. Well, <coughs> we're going to start by looking at the good old Lord of the Rings. Um, for some reason. And the reason is because we're going to talk about what happens in, in, Lord, in the Lord of the Rings books. So, in the Hobbit, they start here in the Shire, and they travel east and they meet trolls. And then they go through the mountains and there's giants and uh, goblins. And they go to and they meet the Orn. Right? Then they go clear here to the lake and they meet the dragon. Which is the whole point of the event, right? Okay. Then in Lord of the Rings, they head out and they meet like Ascension Mountain, which animated by Saruman. And then they go through Moria, and then they go out here and they, um, they meet Galadriel, and they get, they encounter um, well, later on because they encounter uh, they're going through the Reopen army, they meet Gondor, Gon, and the the primitives who lead them through the forest. They aren't in the movie, but they're it's these cavemen people, right? And then when the, the main troop goes over here and they go through the mountains, there's Shelob, right? And so. But, uh, over here also, there's uh, my least favorite uh, Tolkien guy, which is um, Tom, uh, Tom Bombadil. Yeah, everyone's least favorite Tolkien guy, right? So but the point is that then you, you look in campaigns based on Lord of the Rings, games based on other things, and and if you look, where's the cool things in Middle Earth? It's like, well, they're here, 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 and here. But I, I look at this and I say, okay, they go these two random directions to meet all these weird things. Bjorn, Shelob happens to be here, Don Murray Don. And in my mind, it says, this doesn't mean that that's where the interesting things are. It must mean there's, there's things like that everywhere in Middle Earth that we didn't get to see because we only went in the two routes. Right? It must be full of stuff. And Glorantha is kind of the same way. We have this big thing in Glorantha, and for historical reasons, it's all been focused on Dragon Pass and Prax. And we know all the cool things that are there, but the rest of the world, presumably, has a lot of things too, right? It's not just it's not just Dragon Pass that has the interesting stuff. So I was talking to someone yesterday, and we mentioned that I had a campaign that started in Kent. In fact, I guess I should put a Glorantha map here. This is a, a, a very accurate Glorantha map, of course. Um, Stella, the East Isles. Um, Tilly goes. The World Rule. So wrong. Um, and then here's Pamela. And Swan. Okay, there's all this stuff. But but 99% of the stuff published has been right here or sometimes up here a little bit in glory. Okay. Now, so I said this, we're mentioning, oh, we have this campaign where we started in Pent. 
and we did things there. And she said, oh, well, I can't do anything with that because there's no, not enough public information on it. And I realized that she was going about it kind of the way that Cassie has been training people to do, but it's the wrong way. And what it is, it's not that we don't have information on PET, it's that we don't have information on PET, so you can do whatever you want. You can do Mongol things, you can make, you can meet the equivalent of Genghis Khan, you can have Mongolian death worms, you can have frozen mammoths, like they had, right? And of course, in the, if you look at the legend of mammoths in actual Siberia, what they said was, was that they figured they'd, they'd see these big frozen monsters um, on top of the snow where, where it melted away. They said, oh, well, these are these burrowing things that go through the ice, and when they come up to the surface, they die when they see the sun. So, of course, that's what they're going to be in Glanta, right? These burrowing things that die when they see the sun. So, um, why not, right? But the thing is, you can do all this stuff. None of that stuff's in the books. I just made up the mammoth thing right now, this second, because I said, oh, what are some Mongolian adventures? Okay, the point is that when you're, that the things, a lot of Glorantin campaigns, and because a lot of surmise and speculation and focus has been on <coughs> trying to make things historically appropriate, so you have clan tattoos and the Florians look more like Hindus than Romans and all these other things, they're trying to go down into depth, but you can also have a degree of breadth. My campaigns would typically I mean, but even if you're, if you want to play in Dragon Pass, you can make up all sorts of stuff. When I played with Greg, we just, this sort of thing happened all the time. We'd be in Dragon Pass, the best known, best map place in the world, and Greg said, oh, we're going to go to this little, little town. So we go to the little town, and, and, uh, and, he's, and the people of town, talk about, they have the spitting tower. There's a, there's a tower you can go into. So he went to do it, and, this, and, this, and there was a big face, and it looked at him and said, not the one, and then spit him way out, okay? And Greg never, Greg just had it there as this weird thing, okay? But it was just out of the blue. Now, if I was just a player in the campaign at that point, but if we decided to do something with the spitting tower, what would have happened is that Greg would have given me more background, and there may not be any more background than that he wanted to have a, this fun thing that spit you out. But then I would try to figure out some way to work in the blank that has something interesting happen in there. You know, for example, giving players a clue as to who the one was, they can go try to find him, or, or he, they, he might spit someone out and say, you're not the one yet. You know, and, and something interesting with this big tower. Okay, besides, Grant, Grant just had this kind of joke, uh, Greg just had kind of a joke, you know, but, uh, but he would put these things right into Dragon Cast, these, these wacky things. Um, so you can have, it is, we keep saying all the time, it's your Glorantha. And that, you, sh you should take that literally. It's literally yours to do what you want. If you feel constrained by the historical published stuff, or not constrained, but you want to obey it, then you can do things, you can set it in a different year, you can set it in a different area. My campaigns hardly ever were here, because that place, that ground's been gone over so many times. So we, we always travel the world, and going somewhere new where I can just put in whatever I want. You know, you can imagine if I did Lord of Grace campaign, they wouldn't go here, they'd be out here meeting whatever okay. I made up, you know. If there's a cave in here, maybe there's a cave in someone else. Or if there's half orcs here, maybe there's something half dwarfs or something, you know. Now, <clears throat> you can have both depth and breadth in a, camp in a thing like this. We try to always put something fun into every adventure. Uh, as an example, if you read the old adventures, they, they, they're going into um, uh, one of the, I think it's, dry, it's uh, Snake Eye Apollo or something, and there's a giant. And, and then the giant's text isn't just, here's a giant monster to fight, it says, you can flatter the giant and praise him, and then he'll like, let you buy and do things. He'll be your buddy. And that's not usually the, what happens when you need a monster in a dungeon, right? But he does that. Um, we, had a, uh, we had a campaign where the players started up here, because it was a place no one knew about. Okay, it was called Tron, because that's the name of an old uh, Norwegian city. So why not, right? And there were so few like Vikings. And then what happened is, they, is Tron had been burned up by, um, by, by lunars. Not, not these lunars, but the blue moon guys. Um, when they were away, and, the Tron, and Tron was mostly ancestor worship. How do I know that? Because one of the players said he was an ancestor worshiper. I said, okay, he's ancestor worship. So when we went back to Tron to find that everyone had been killed, well, everyone on Tron was now like, 
an angry ghost or a wraith or a revenant or something, but their ancestor worshippers, so like, those are their relatives. And those, and that's what they had, right? But they're still zombies and trying to eat them. So, so then they like wandered around and they came back and they found that some people had colonized it and were, and were gradually getting rid of all the undead. So the players decided to ally themselves with the undead and fight against the colonizers and they, and they had this long war on Tron and, they, and we went into all this depth on Tron. We made up all kinds of things. We had the, the evil black hag who was trying to bring in the black eater. And even though she was technically on the player's side, they really didn't want the Black Eater to show up because it was just bad. And, uh, <clears throat> and they had all these adventures. It was a, and the campaign initially culminated after 14 years. It culminated and they, they conquered, they reconquered Tron and they set up their um, civilization. And we made up all kinds of things along the way. One thing is that the old method of killing people in Tron, the execution was you'd strangle them and throw them in the bog, like in ancient England. So then they said, well, are there bog men down there that we can reanimate? And I said, sure, why not? Because they're you know, your ancestors, even if they're criminals. So they had bog men. <laughs> but they, they finished the campaign, and the players were tough, and they had a kingdom. I said, you know, there's nothing more to do here. We're done with this campaign, and we went somewhere else. Then later on in another campaign, the players went back to Tron, and I had the old player characters like grab the new player characters and imprison them. And the, I said, what would, your, what would your players do? The old ones said, oh, say, we'd imprison, we don't want adventurers around here. And they, and they, and they put them on trial and sentenced them to death. <laughs> and, but then they gave them an out when they were sentenced to death. So they were able to, they were able to do something uh, cool. They said, well, we're gonna pretend your death, but really you have to go through this horrible done place that normally you would never do. But you have to now because, you know, we got you. So the players were terrified of their old play characters and tormented by them. And that was all on the players. That's part of the fun I do. Is I, the fun for me is when players start discussing things. And the fun isn't just from me making up stuff, but the, play, but the dynamic of the players doing things. As an example, um, yesterday I was talking with Chris, who's in my campaign. And we mentioned an event that I'd totally forgotten, which is in one of his characters, they were fighting a monster somewhere, and the monster transferred its soul into him and him into the monster. And somehow we talked the other players into killing the monster so his soul could come back. Okay? And I don't remember anything about that or how that worked. But he mentioned it, so I, then I suddenly thinking, what would be cool about swapping souls with the monster? And I thought, well, something that might be cool is what if they swap souls and the, and the monsters and the players start both claiming they're really the player? then the other players don't know who to kill, right? And I wouldn't tell them which one which was true, so that even the player didn't know. And then I thought, what if they killed the wrong one, and then when they leave the dungeon, the player is actually still the monster? And I said, okay, I wouldn't tell the player. I'd have him be the monster, but not know it. And then as he started to do things, he find out that, that like, I'm going to do a heal here. He said, well, you know, you're, you've forgotten your heal spell somehow. He goes, I forgot my heal spell? Yeah, but you have your incinerate spell that can, that can white hot burn holes in the wall. And you're like, where did that come from? And then gradually they realize that he had all these new things. He didn't recognize people that he was actually the monster. And the player says, what the heck? How am I a monster? I said, well, the monster's trying to pretend to be you. So all, <clears throat> so all of your reactions as being surprised were the monster and you're actually the monster. And here's your new stats. And then they have decided, well, is the monster going to be on our side? Is it not going to be on our side? And that would, I haven't done that, but it's, I think it would be a really interesting thing for the players, a puzzle for the players to handle. Um, I did other things. A, a, a lot, um, I have some, I, I want to bring something in just for fun and, um, and just try it. So I, so I uh, invented the Outer Atomic Explorers for an adventure, and these were god murder time eras characters that took basically rocket ships and went out into the chaos and came back. And so I I, uh, I decided that to go into chaos, go into the chaos is super super painful. So all these guys had surgery to have all their major nerve trunks severed, so they couldn't feel any pain, and they were controlled by by powered crystals on their chest that they that they operate with. Okay, and but because they went into chaos, that's the outer case is outside time. So they come back and they fall into the future, which means they're in the player's time, in the third age, and their goal was to go find their ship, which is of course in a ruin of the second age, 
to get back home. They go home, they go into chaos again, they get home. So the players help them. Meanwhile, they're being chased by Fidelity, I think, who wanted to basically dissect the outer atomic explorers and get power from them. So they're running along with them, they have this little adventure, and then they finally, they're being chased so closely by the bad guys that everyone gets in the spaceship and takes off. And this whole idea I took from an old science fiction story where they said it hurts to go through hyperspace, so explorers have to have their nerve trunk severed so they don't feel pain. And then there was this whole subplot that went on in the story, which is a short story. Right? I, but I thought that was an interesting idea um, that these people were insulated. So, they go, so all the players went in the outer, the outer thing, and I said, yeah, I think they can get back home. But then the players are, are rained out, and they are back in the second age in, in Fernella before the closing. And they're trying to figure out how to get back to their time. They, they, uh, and I was trying to think of ways to make it interesting, always in connections, because um, you can use old connections as well as new ones. And in the stories, it says a bad guy here, a big enemy of Prince um, Snowdle, is Black Ralph the Weasel. Ow. What? Ow. Ow. So Black. When you say his name, it hurts. Oh, yeah, yeah. When you say, when you say Black Ralph's name, then you take the damage. Um, which I just made up on the spot because it was made by Ralph the Scarier. I forgot <laughs> when I did that until now. So, so it turned out that some of the characters came from this area, and Black Ralph was their ancestor, and he's an ancestor worker just like them. So when he sees them, hey, this is great. I'm happy to meet you. My, 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 and they're like, but you're like the evil bad guy. And he says, yeah, but he's all happy. So eventually they decide they have to help Snowball anyway because Black Ralph is totally evil. And in the fight, Black Ralph is fighting. He's super good. And he's not hitting any of his descendants. He won't attack them. But the other guys, if they show up, he'll black it. Right? The guys who aren't descendants, he blasts. So it was, a, so it was a, a puzzle. The players kind of felt bad when they finally defeated Black Ralph. And they said, well, am I remembered in the future? And they say, Yes, you are, you know. <laughs> but they worship him, you know, and um, then they help Snow and then Snow does, does the syndic span, and the players are put into, into, into like extended sleep, like Rip Van Winkle. And then they wake up, you know, 85 years later in their current time, or wherever it was, and now they're back in their time. But I actually have them go into the past and into the future, and that's the kind of thing that's not really talked about in the current. Weren't the books because it's, it's something you can't you can't have a whole plan for that. That's something that you make up on the spot. And if you look at the old Weren't material, you'll see there's little weird things like this everywhere. Sometimes you can, sometimes there are ideas from a story I read. Sometimes there are ideas from some connection in uh, in Glorantha. So as another example, our campaign goes went here and then it came back and then it enters the Tunnel Hills. A place which um, mostly I had made up because it wasn't anything really. They just knew it was a chaos nest. So I had to have a map of everything. I actually made the map when I was back at Chaosium. And then I used that map with my campaign. Well, one of the things in there, there was this big underground thing that I said, without thinking what it would mean, there's chaos dwarfs here. I have no idea what chaos dwarfs were then. But the players were going in there and said, okay, what would chaos dwarfs be in Glorantha? And I said, all the dwarfs are trying to fix the world machine. So the chaos dwarfs are too. What's their heresy for what's wrong? And I decided that, that their heresy <clears throat> was that the reason they weren't able to fix the machine is because they're missing one of the metals. And the metal they're missing is the metal based on Uranos, the sky god who was never injured and didn't bleed. So you don't have his metal on the ground. He wasn't killed. You don't have his metal bones on the ground. So they're, they're synthesizing his bones or trying to go in and bring them back. I said, well, what's Uranos' metal? It's obviously uranium. <laughs> so the chaos dwarfs are making uranium armor and weapons. And of course, this mutates them, you know, and, and gives them cancer. So they're hideous chaos monsters, but they're trying to fix the world machine in their way. So the players go and fight them, and they're fighting one of their constructs. Uh, and it's wearing iron armor, and they, they knock a hole in the armor, and this light shines out, and they realize it's like the radiation, and they're like, I don't want to fight these monsters, they give us cancer, you know? <laughs> so, and so the Chaos Dwarfs became much more interesting than just a bunch of dwarfs with Chaos features. I mean, that's what they were, but they had this crazy plan, and they had the uranium sword, so you don't want to really take their, um, their treasures, you know? And, that was, and they were only this one brief thing. They went through one thing in the mountain that was there. But now, forever, I'll have that we have the uranium dwarfs, which, uh, 
which have a good excuse for being chaotic. So a lot of our ideas for entire campaigns were based initially on jokes. I like to have fun when right? I do funny things. So as another example, the ducks came around as a joke. You probably, you probably everyone's heard the story where the ducks came from. The duck, so we had the, we had those ridiculous ducks in Goranta. Okay, and I think that one of the wrong kind of things that's been doing is, is some people tried to make the ducks cool by having the durals and gave them an ancestry and stuff. I don't think I don't think you want to play it. I don't think anyone really wants to be a dural. You want to be a duck. In the early development of Goranta, we had a very good artist draw pictures uh, and draw pictures for figures for, for little standees. And so she was doing all the and she wanted to do the ducks. Well, she made realistic ducks with little hands to fight. They look like they look like actual ducks. And Greg said, "No, don't do that." She says, "What do you mean? These are great." And he says, "No, no one wants to be that kind of duck. You want to be Donald Duck. You want to be Daffy Duck. You want to be Howard the Duck." And so she went back and made him goofy. He said, "That's the kind of duck players want to be. That's, if you're going to be a duck and have all the disadvantages, you don't want to be some kind of realistic thing." So, and that's why I resisted ever giving the ducks a background in my games. I said, sure, they have a background, but like hobbits, they just adopt the local human culture. You know, when they went to the East Isles, there was, there was the Keats, of which most of them were ducks. And I came up with the idea, because how can Keats survive there, is that it's bad luck to kill a duck. So they, you know, and now that's actually in God's of Grant, uh, not God's of Grant, um, the Grant Wars. Uh, God's War, yeah, that it was bad luck to kill a duck. And that's where it came from, our campaign, where we decided it was bad luck. So in that campaign, they need a pirate ship. And I said, well, we'll have, we'll have a duck on the pirate ship. So it's Blackbeak, the terror of the seven seas, with a little wispy beard, and I think it's Blackbeak, right? Well, they kept took him prison. They didn't want to kill him because, you know, he's a duck. And then he became a PC. When one of the PCs got killed, he was replaced with Blackbeak. <coughs> it turned out he wasn't really the captain of the pirate ship. He was more like a mascot. You know, but uh, he became a major character, and so we had this duck aboard the ship that became a major part of the campaign. There was a point where one of the players was a power gamer and wanted to be a minotaur because they have a million billion strength and con, and he was. And the minotaur was always making fun of the duck and threatening the duck <laughs> and uh, and annoying the duck. And one day they went out of trouble, and the minotaur bought um, got, got a whole bunch of orange sauce. For the duck, in case they, right? And the duck's like, ah. And the duck is a player, mind you, and so is the minotaur. Well, we go into this terrible ruins, the uh, clanking city. <coughs> we went to a room, an area that was actually based on one of my Doom levels, because why not, right? <laughs> and, and so we go in there, and all these fire elementals come out of the walls, and, and they burn the minotaur to death, and then they win the battle, but the minotaur's burned and they take the body back to the ship. The so, old oh, poor minotaur is forced to death. Then for dinner that night, the duck is also the cook. <laughs> because they gave him a job. And they had, they had orange beef, beef all orange. They're like, where did we get beef? We've only been eating like dry fish and stuff. And then after a while they realized that the orange beef was the other PC. That the duck had cooked him with the orange sauce. And then, well, we don't know for sure because he never said it. But that's another word like, well, don't ask, don't tell. And they, they just ate it right. <laughs> <laughs> so that was kind of a joke, but it was an interesting <coughs> interaction between the players that was memorable. And later on, Blackbeak became more and more important in the campaign until finally he was uh, he was transferred to the soul of a dragon and uh, and died <laughs> because uh, right. But um, another thing that we did as as jokes that turned into something today is the players went to Telios. Now in Telios, if you read the stuff, <coughs> there's six I think different colors, five different colors, some number of different colors. And Greg made up Telios basically as a joke about racism. Okay, where each, where all the colors said, oh, the red ones get mad all the time and beat their children, and the, and the green ones like to eat frogs, and the yellow ones are super lazy. And, and, he, and he didn't, and he said, none of us do this is all the race thing. Is that all you want to be is this racist thing? He said, yeah, that's all I want to be. So my players went there, and I said, what can we do more with this? Because <clears throat> I said, I know that Telios used to be the big pirate kingdom, so somehow they cooperated back then. And I said, there's no reason to think they weren't all multicolored then. So I came up with this idea that, that, the, that the prejudices against all the races were actually true, okay? But that it was a feature of them, not a bug, if you know what I mean. So for example, the yellow ones who were like lazy, okay, they're always looking for the easy, smart way of doing things, so they make good planners and leaders. The red ones who get angry real easy were really good warriors, you know, and everyone, the, the uh, green ones who could eat terrible things, you know, they are, uh, they are good scouts from the Baltimore land, and everyone had some ability. 
that made them better. So if you put them all together and they can cooperate, you have a perfect crew for a pirate ship. <coughs> okay, and and this and but the, but the people didn't mostly know it because they'd forgotten that. The, and basically, the closing and the third age had separated them into different tribes. Okay, but to keep them from killing each other, I I also came up with with Greg's blessing that when one of, one of them, when a Telios person has a baby, it's a random color. It's not it's not their color necessarily. And then if a tribe was low in numbers, the other tribes would have more of that color baby. Um, to replace it. So people didn't go kill the other tribes. That's meant if you kill the yellows, that's meant everyone starts giving birth to yellows. So it's pointless. So they just live in unharmony. So our hero is trying to figure out how to um, how to get them to work together. And uh, that was his that was his plan. I thought and that made Telios, I thought, gave it a little more depth, a little more background, a little more interesting. The racial prejudice is still there because it's hurting them really badly to have that. On the other hand, when they get to act together, then they're going to be a mighty pirate kingdom, so maybe that's not good. But the players, being mostly pirates, were sort of okay with that. Another example. In the campaign, there was a, a girl, well, a woman, right? And she said, and she decided she wanted to have a, a, a pet lion. She came to an island up here where there's supposed to be dwarf lions. I said, sure, you have a pet lion. So you had a pet lion, and we were in Africa, and then I realized after a while that no one in the party had ever seen a lion except for this one, and the girl herself said it was a lion, but she, the only lion she knew were the things from her island. So I thought, Wait, I can, and she was from Dinosaur Island. So she, was no from, she was from Dinosaur Mammals, there was no mammals, that's right, there was no mammals on our island, but she got that lion. So, so the next time the lion attacked, I said, it stings them. And they said, it stings them? I said, yeah, with the stinger, you know, like lions have. They're like, lions have stingers? Do you know otherwise? And they go, no. Then, then after a while, it was attacking with like tentacles and a poison bite and all these things. And they're like, and everyone starts realizing that the lion is some kind of awful monster. <laughs> it's not a lion at all. But since no one had seen lions, there's no lions in Hamiltella, they, they still call it a lion and went around with it. And, it, and uh, it, that one mostly stated a fun joke. His stats were the same as the lion, you know? But, uh, but eventually, uh, well, she left the campaign because she divorced her husband, who was also in the campaign, but but uh, uh, eventually I, I probably would have done something with that lion and found out what it really was and done the connection and gone down and do things. So the point is that you could that even with Glorantha having all this information that controls and, um, and and tells you what there is and you have to do this kind of thing, in the first place you can obey you can obey just as much of that as it's fun, okay. Like, uh, like with the Iranian dwarfs, I said, oh, dwarfs are trying to fix the world machine. That's a known fact. How can I make that fun? Um, the, uh, the fact that lions are almost extinct in Grant means I can do something fun with the lions with a bunch of guys I haven't seen them before. And I was able to add things anywhere, just like Greg did with this speaking tower. And just like you would do in Lord of the Rings. So Grant doesn't need to be a place where you spend all your time being a Kolimar tribesman in Dragon Pass and getting clan tattoos and trying to get trying to steal cows. I mean, you can do that if you want. Nothing's wrong with that. But you can also go off into the waste and find the, ele the lost elephant tribe. This is, this is not a, my idea. This is another player did the lost elephant tribe. And what happened is that, the old, is that there's a tribe of the elephant riders, right? But they only have one elephant left. So all the tribe follows around this one elephant. And the lunars are trying to get the elephant. And they're trying to get the elephant into the waste because they've heard there's a male elephant they can breed with. And so the players... Like, either choose to help fight them and get the elephant or help hold off the looters and save the elephant, but it was this ridiculous tribe with one elephant, which is kind of, you know, funny to think about it, but then it was an actual campaign with looters doing things and stuff, and it's actually set in the main place here. And of course, the official rules say nothing about an elephant tribe, but so what? I mean, it's got all these bizarre little tribes. I'm sure there could have been a dozen more that aren't mentioned, you know? So that is uh, kind of what I did. I went, when the players went to Tristella, um, we had them find a, uh, <coughs> this was back in the 80s, um, everyone here had a plan to destroy the humans when they, because they woke up from Tristella, because there was, there was elf dwarfs and, and uh, trolls, and they all had a plan to destroy the humans. So the players were like, what? And I always played the dwarfs as kind of goofy. Uh, I mean, dangerous, but goofy. So, they, so the dwarfs, one of the dwarf players was a dwarf, 
And so, and my treat, my, the way I play player character dwarfs is these are broken dwarfs that can't really function in society anymore, so they're on the surface. But the other dwarfs say, hey, you can be in the surface, and you're still a dwarf. You gotta be, so the other dwarfs would give them assignments that they could do or not, but they didn't give me a reward for it because they're a dwarf. You know? So the other dwarf, Grafangle Storch was his name, because um, so I started giving dwarfs all long names because of Grafangle Storch. And then he went in and saw the ultimate weapon they had to destroy the humans. And he looks at it, and, and, uh, it's sh and the idea was of trying to show that the dwarfs are skilled, but not necessarily practical. And what they had was a super gigantic ballista with a huge arrow, and that was the ultimate weapon. Yeah, right? Said, Look, this can kill anything. And he said, yup. <laughs> you know, it fires once every six hours. I said, yup. <laughs> it's a true stone head with spells. Great. <laughs> he didn't even tell them like how stupid their idea was. So then I thought about this in my later campaign, which I placed, I went to Salon, which has dinosaurs. And there's dwarfs there, we also know. So I had the players trying to set up a port city. I was usually doing some kind of plot that trying to set up, establish a city or set up a trade route or, 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 or help save the undead out of Tron, you know? And um, here the idea was trying to set up a port because they've been kicked out of, uh, of the original city by expanding in Afajani. And so they're over here, so they're mostly wizards. And so the dwarfs decided they had to destroy the port because they don't want technological humans over there. So the dwarfs sent their guys to attack the city and the humans all knew, okay, the dwarfs are gonna be the best siege, siege uh, warfare that there's ever been. And we can't let them get to the city. So they went out with some of the, uh, with some of the dinosaur people and they decided the way to get it, the dwarfs aren't gonna be good at surface combat. So they were raiding and harassing the dwarfs on the way in. And the dwarfs had no idea how to respond. Like the first night, they just all laid around sleeping and the humans attacked and killed some of them. They go, oh, that's dangerous. So the next night, they were all in foxholes, separate foxholes where they couldn't help each other. And then they had, the third night, they like had grouped foxholes in a, in a palisade, but they moved slower. And then, you know, then they came to the river and started building the bridge. And the players somehow got a herd of brontosaurs or something to destroy the bridge and wash it away. And then the dwarfs finally you made peace, right? But it was, but it was interesting because the dwarfs were a combination of powerful and dangerous, but they didn't really understand the surface world. Clueless, yeah. And that was a personality trait I mean, that was fun. Uh, one of the players in the campaign, after they landed uh, in, the, in the past, uh, he wanted the, he, uh, they, they, they were they were inside the closing when they got to the future again, and he and he wanted to be an elf. In fact, it was him. So I said, I'm going to be an elf. So I said, well, we're in the closing where things are from ancient times. I say, you're a white elf, because the books talk about white elves. And all we know is that they were good, and they were all made extinct when the spike gets murdered. So he's the last white elf. So he joins the campaign. I gave him stats like a regular. He was pretty good. He, eventually, he was able to shoot like two arrows at a time, like Legolas and all kinds of stuff. But, but I, then I think about it, well, the elves are based on plants. And i got to get this guy interesting puzzles. Because, of course, one of his goals is to find other white elves. So I came up with the idea that the white elves have five sexes, you know, and, I, and none of them are male or female, right, I don't think. They all have these weird names, you know, the, the snarl, the band, you know, and so, and, and he has to, he has to, so instead of just getting one other sex, he has to get four other sexes to breed. And so, and so his whole, like, his whole little sub-campaign was find, the, find out what the other sexes do and get one. You know, he's going on hero quest trying to find them. I don't know if you ever got all five. Yeah, I got four scenes. You got, well, you got four seats, okay, yeah. yeah. But, it, but it was a little fun sub-quest for him, though the other players didn't really care about that much. They didn't care about anybody else. But, you know, they were really helpful. with I also do a lot of riffing off what the players come up with. Um, because they have undead on Tron, they had a bunch of skeletons, and they realize they're gonna be attacked by a bunch of Vikings on ships. So actually, the Vikings are attacking the mermen. Because the women up here are the big walrus ones, and I figured that the Vikings kill the mermen because they're helpless on land and they like cleanse them and use the blubber. So the mermen call on, on Tron for help, and Tron says, Well, if we help them, they'll be on our side. So the whole plan was, we'll have to go fight the Vikings, but the, mer the walrus mermen can't really do much to a guy on a ship, but if you can knock them off the ship into the water, they can get them. So how can we get them to jump off the ship? And my technique of gaming, which is, I don't remember everyone, is that I, ha I present problems to the players and I have no idea how they're gonna solve it. That's their, they have to solve it. I just make up the problem. So the players, one of the players came up with the idea and says, what could make you want to jump off a ship into the water? And he said, bees, bees can do it. How do we get bees to the island up here where they're attacking? And he had the idea of putting beehives inside 
the rib cage of skeletons. And the skeletons would walk up there and they'd open their mouth and the bees would fly out. And I said, this is such a brilliant idea, it absolutely works. And so I, was, the, I had all these bike things set up and they just weren't ready to deal with bees. So the, so the fight, there's still a fight going on, but it was pretty entertaining. And then when they went back, um, <clears throat> the, the players talked about it and said, you know, we have these bees, beehives that are now mobile because skeleton can't get stung, and we can move our beehives around to the best flowers. So we set up a skeleton farms, which uh, a thing where the, where the, where the, where the skeletons would like skeleton farms honey, because they were like really good, you got really good honey out of the skeletons. And so later on in the game, periodically they'd be over here or here, and they'd find a big wrap of skeleton honey that had come from the, the place. So it would make it feel like, like the previous actions had had some honey impact on why I thought, however limited. And a lot of the mystery races, you know, are things that I made up for my campaign because I wanted to have that. Uh, uh, and you can do the same. You don't have to use my ideas. You can have, that's the whole point, is you can have your ideas, and your ideas can come from a chance mentioned in a book that sounds interesting that you can work on. It can come from a joke a player makes. It can come from some of the connection in your head. And um, usually what happens if, I, if I'm with the players and I come up with an idea, I can't use that idea yet because I have to like plot it out for the next week. And so next week I come back and it's there and then they, they, they're hung by their own petard because they, like, they, like he gave me the idea for the monster that takes over players. So that's probably going to happen next time we get work a game. But. Anyway, this is my approach to making the micro fun. Let me do whatever you want, wherever you want, and not worrying about the things you have in the books that you don't like. Use the things you do like because they're, they help trigger ideas. And uh, with, that is my little lecture with a bunch of examples. So I think in terms of examples a lot, not generic stuff. So with that, I will open it up to questions. I have two. Okay. So, so intentionally design-wise, when you were creating the stuff back then and put stuff in books, you, you, I have the feeling that one of the intentional goals, goals was to put ideas in, you know, like every other paragraph that are fun or playable or was, you know, or triggered something. Was that the intention? So the way that, that it worked from Greg and I, Greg came up with cool things, basically Greg thought in a literary mythic sense. So he came up with cool ideas for, um, uh, 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 that, he, that he thought were, um, were, were interesting, like the Spitting Tower, but he didn't think of what they would do in the game, okay? He said, oh, there's this cool, there's, you know, we have the Spitting Tower, you know, uh, and, we'll, and that's the, 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 the cool thing. And then I would take his ideas and I would turn them into something interesting for a game, okay? I didn't do it with the Spitting Tower, but a lot of places I did. He said, oh, we're gonna have the, the, the I forget the name of the Chaos Maze in, the, in the, the Pavis Rubble, but Greg said, oh, the Devil's Playground. And Greg said, oh, no one has ever come back from the Devil's Playground because it's so terrible. Which, which uh, you know, he, I said, no one's come back, can't we afford it? And he goes, well, isn't it terrifying that no one's came back? And I said, yeah, but. So then I did the Devil's Playground scenario where you go in there and find out why it's so terrible, but, you know, you can come back and you make it. And maybe the legend just don't come back. So I, so I turned the Devil's Playground into a fun thing where you get a bunch of other so You're going to the place that no one's come back. And then I found out what was down in the playground, and the players did. And uh, it was uh, it was those, those dumb spider things that fall that fall through the uh, the tubes. I can't remember Karsh. Yeah, yeah, Karsh kids. 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 But there was Karsh kids that had mutated with people too. So those human Karsh kid combos and all this stuff. Plus, of course, the bruise, you know. But because uh, bruises are always a, a good thing to have. So a uh, great so we'd have these ideas. You know, and like one of my Greg's ideas about Derastor is that everything we know about Derastor is always a lie. So one of the known facts about Derastor is if you've read Cults of Terror, they have that whole story where Ralzakark is preparing this giant army to attack, um, to, 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 to attack Brolia. Well, he, Greg, Greg said, it's not Ralzakark that did that. It's, it's a real plot. There's a real brew leader, <coughs> but it's not Ralzakark because Ralzakark is doing something else. So. So then, then another one of the players, he did a map of the raster. Now you've probably seen the map of the raster. Here's, here's the mountains around here. And then there's like the Hellwoods, and here's the Poison Thorn. 
and uh, over here is like gray dust and various stuff. Okay, so what happened is one of the players, one of the guys at Chaosium actually said, well, if everything about the raster is a lie, then this has to be a lie. So we made a new map with the same outside mountains, because everyone knew about that, but all this map was in this little corner here. And then the rest was all on the shelf. And people just thought this was a whole of the raster, but it wasn't. So I like, so I said, that's an, that's an interesting idea. And, um, and that's, and in my campaign, that's kind of what our role was. So you both have the old raster, the first things, but you have this other stuff that no one expects, um, which, you know, was fun. And do you remember the origin, origin of the, the little box text, the hero was coming, or what were they called? The little boxes were partly me, partly gray. If, it, if, it, if it's something mythical and ominous, it's Greg, and if it's something goofy, it's probably me. Although some of Greg's scenes are goofy, too. Uh, the little boxes. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, but yeah, if you read the old things like Troll Pack, there's always silly stuff in it to, um, to, to trigger things, because we would do that a lot. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, we always wanted to make it to seem like a fun place to play. It wasn't a place just to explore and admire the, the world building. It was a place that you would do cool things in. That's why I got interested in it originally, because what happened is that way back in the 70s, I bought a copy of, of White Bear Red Moon. And White Bear Red Moon had all these wacky units in it. It was really crazy. There's the Black Horse Troop and the Dragon Utes and all this stuff. And so my D &D, I used the map of White Bear Red Moon to play my D&D &D campaign on. And we meet those things. Then later on, RuneQuest came out. And I said, what's this? A new role-playing system. I looked at the back. And it said it was in Gloron, but they spelled it wrong. And they said, oh, this is the same place as, as that game. Cool. So we started playing RuneQuest. And then I found things about Rune, RuneQuest I love that made it much better than D&D. And went on from there. But the point is, I get interested in it. <clears throat> East was this weird, varied place. You know, it wasn't because of tribal tattoos or Hindu religion. It was because there's the Black Horse Troop from hell. There's the Dragon Newts. There's, there's dinosaurs that are actually evolved dragons that, that went wrong. So I've used that before too. Um, there's tusk riders. So we had, so like I had the tusk riders, the big thing about tusk riders in the original game was they had a appearance of 1d6. So they were really repulsive. So that's the main thing we know about tusk riders. So naturally, <clears throat> when our players stop here in Camellia where the pigmen live, I said, well, the pigmen are tusk riders, because why not, right? And then the, the players had gotten a love potion from somewhere. <laughs> I forget what they were going to use it for. Oh, they had a leftover love potion, and and uh, and they and they were trying to love potion one of the other character, one of the other enemies, but accidentally got into the into the, the chief tusk rider's drink. So he was then madly in love with one of the players, and we rolled for the tusk rider's appearance. And it was like two or something, and so from then on, that tusk rider was obsessed with that with that woman. And she was like, no. And so there was a lot of, there was a lot of teasing going on. We're like, she went to his tent and, and, uh, and, and she said, look, nothing happened. I just ran around the tent and says, remember when we went to the tent? Yes, when nothing happened. Because the, you know, the, girl, the girl was like, well, it was a man playing a woman, but, but he was arguing for the uh, writer. Another thing I would do to calm my different systems is uh, we went to the Clanking City, which is the big ruins from the God time. I decided that all the magic items in there <clears throat> would be the crocked bad magic items from D and D because they had all these bad magic <laughs> items. And and but but the thing is in RuneQuest these are great. So for example, the, the reason that one character was a female is because they got they got the belt that when you put it on it changes your sex, which is a bad magic item in D and D. And they said, "Wow, this is great. <laughs> we could, he put it on and turned into a girl." And um, and then like he couldn't take it off, didn't turn him back, and they go, "We can use this to do things." So they use it to overthrow the Israeli uh, royal marriage by turning the stormhole husband into a girl. Um, and then they ran away. But they, but, but all I, so there was like potions of delusion, you know, potions, and all these things. But those were, those were good in Glorantha. Because any of the, you know, the, 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 the scarab that burst away your heart, think how great that would be in Glorantha, you know? So all, those, so all those stupid magic items, which are totally useless in D&D, suddenly became the treasures of that place, and the players loved it. And, you know, like I said, I still like this from science fiction stories. Everything could go in. 
So I had this this one moment with Craig at the very first break, and I, I thought maybe that was your experience too with him creatively. When I, I asked him the fanboy question about, hey Greg, you know, you know that when humanities die, they go to the this, the sword hall and of human and you know and forever fight and train for the time they come out of hell and stuff like that. And said, but this one thing that's odd about it is like, how can you get better? And have, why do they train? How do they? How does anything anyone get better in hell? And, and Greg never thought about this. There, he, he didn't occur to him. And um, then he said, oh. He th very briefly thought about it, it's like, oh, they, they're just cutting away everything that's not human from each other, so they become more human. And, and, and that's probably, was that something that's similar to you when you pointed something Yeah, it's the kind of thing, you know, like, like, like we go on, the, he, he had multiple planes of the god plan. So one of the planes, they went there, and there was a bunch of uh, elves being, um, uh, being uh, whipped and beaten along by a bunch of storm bulls. And, huh, then they went up to the next little full of plane, and they met the tumblewoods, which were trees rolling along in a storm, which they were the same thing, but different views. So, and then I, from ever since then, I've been looking for a chance to get the tumblewoods into a campaign, but I never have. But now it's, now you can use it. <laughs> so so, so it's, it's, a, it's a very vibrant, and it, it feels like, like you still, Every, uh, you both were still exploring the whole thing, you know, it yeah. wasn't a fine yeah. Oh yeah, we had no idea what was out there. We just made up stuff. To me, Gloranker was always a lot more like Oz than it was like um, an archaeological, yeah. you know, yeah. social, uh, uh, social study. Yeah, that's where it comes from, I think. Well, Greg, you have to understand that until he was in college, he'd never, never read a fantasy book. Yeah. His whole contact with fantasy was reading mythology books about ancient mythology. So when he was, and when he was in college, someone gave him an Elric book, I think. And he says, oh, they're still writing myth. myth. That's cool. That's why his fantasy is really different from the other people's, because he hadn't read fantasy. He just knew about mythology. So his world is mythic. So he made the connection between, oh, this is mythology. Actually, it's not fantasy to him, you know? And yeah. fantasy is based in some... Well, for him, fantasy was mythology, just yeah. modern, right? But most people think of it as... Most people nowadays, they think of fantasy books like Swords of Sorcery and mythology as separate. But Greg never made that connection, which is kind of why it's cool. Never made a distinction. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there might be less depth to a modern fantasy book than the rest of the old mythology stuff, but... But if you have the mythology stuff, and then that's where I would work off with him because he would have these ideas all over the place, and I would take two or three ideas he had and try to make them coherent into something cool. So, so is that also where the idea comes from that all the elder races have a plan? Yes. Know, like, what are that plans? Well, Greg said he had a plan for this, and I said, hey, all the elder races have to have a plan in the short humans. Got it. And he so goes, oh, yeah, they should. And then, then you try to figure out what, what they were, right? Yeah. So originally, it was only the trolls that had plans. And then we, we have plans for the elves and the and the and the dwarves too. Yeah, and it's it's interesting because I, like just the other day we found out. I, I always thought you came up with the idea that the that the trolls collecting all the gold and then they they dish it out at one point to ruin the economy of Sata. Yeah. yeah. Well, what happened is Greg had said there's a there's a cave called the Hall of Golden Light in the Gorgon card because trolls don't use gold, right? But of course they raid people, they get gold, so they put all the gold in that cave. And so then I came up with the idea that that's where they execute troll and the trolls they don't like. They put them in that room with all the gold and it poisons them because there's too much gold. And then someone, I don't remember who had the plan, hey, the trolls are smart, they should use the gold. And I don't remember who came up with the idea, but the idea was that when the, when the time was right, the trolls would take all the hundreds of thousands of wheels they connected and they would give it out to the humans to completely destroy the economy of Dragon Pass and turn it into chaos. Then they would take advantage of the chaos. That was that was their plan, you know, because all the pull, all the troll plans turn out to be ideas for how to get a bunch of food. Did the dragon youths have a plan, or is it probably? Just, yeah, but that's yeah. not. So who knows what their plan is, right? Maybe because we can't figure it out. Yeah. Any, <clears throat> any questions? Well, uh, the scalable will start going to S roll at this minute. <laughs> 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 That would be a wonderful way to uh, sort of substitute out of culture and uh, agriculture, really. Yeah. I mean, as Romans are into the ancestor worship and undead in their own peaceful way, so they wouldn't like fight Vikings uh, if 
they can help them. They would definitely have bees and skeletons in their fields. They were was, scared of cows. And, 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 <laughs> and I didn't make this up. The players said we're going to put yeah. beehives in the skeletons. We didn't have bees, but then the bees became a major part of the campaign. No, 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 I have the term Estrogen Scarecrow. Yeah. It's actually an animal <laughs> skeleton with a beehive in it. Makes total sense. <laughs> Our king had married the bee queen. Right? So his yeah. wife was literally a half bee person. And so that's so why like, we could say, hey, our, our kid was born. Oh, what is he? Well, I mean, uh, 990 are girls and there's 10 boys. Because, you know, they're bees, right? <laughs> and, like, uh, oh. You know, they are generally peaceful and uh, docile. There's only one thing that makes them angry the wasp riders. <laughs> <laughs> the wasp riders. So, so, so we all know his next victim is your grandfather named every. Right, but okay. people, but a lot of people have kind of forgotten that. Yeah, but yeah. What, 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 what would be your addition to that? Like, what would be the centipedes and you know, like advice to like using Garanta if you? Well, that's that? I just gave it. No, I mean, is there, is, would that be a synopsis? What, how you would frame that in a way? Yes, if you're if you're playing in Dragon Pass and there's something you don't want, like for example, if you're you're like you want the players to um, uh, to have some big event to trigger the campaign. I would go ahead and let something happen that, for example, completely wipes out a tribe somewhere. Some old established tribe that's in the rules that, oh, they were all killed by the scorpion men or something. Then, then in the empty space, the players have to figure out what to do. Maybe they're the first ones to a town that's been killed by some blight and they have a whole town with all the stuff, but all the people are dead. You know, what do we do? Do we hang on to it? Do we bring people in to colonize? You know, you can, you can take a step by messing with established stuff. By, by doing things with it, you know, then you can have more fun than just like running within the constraints. You can say, okay, well, we have a guy who's trying to become King of Sartre, so he's got to marry the Feathered Horse Queen, he's got to do all this stuff, and, uh, and it's upsetting things, and, the, and of course the Lunars don't want that to happen, so there's a team of assassins are sending after him. And then you have something fun. Is this kind of what you said uh, to me, is like you were always looking out to add stuff. Yes. You know, add stuff to the world and, you know, like not. Yeah. Well, the Giant's Cradle story came out of that. Okay. We, what way does that come from? Then? Okay, so the Giant's Cradle. So we knew that in the river cradles, giants used to send their babies down the river, okay, to go, to go into hell and, and mature. And we know that they built this big island with a rock to catch the cradles and, and loot it. So the giants stopped sending their babies that way. And so the giants are dying out in the north, right, because... They can't send the babies on the cradle. And these aren't the giants that are in Dragon Pass that eat you. These are the huge ones like Gonora in the right the or the Tall. So in in the in the um, at Greg's actual campaign, there was a character called Herb the Ugly, who back then we we rolled um, uh, 3d6 for int, and he rolled a three for int and like a four for appearance. So he said, I'm Herb the Ugly. And they had a war horse, in those days war horses had, had an int of 2d3, so his war horse was literally smarter than him, at four. And so his fighting technique was he had two great shields and he parried while the war horse killed him. Okay? And he decided, he decided that his horse was so, it was Ken Hoffer, that, his, that Herb was so stupid that, that he saw people value wheels, the money, and so he worshipped it. So he had a caravan of like 40,000 wheels that he would pray to. And Greg, to annoy him, we know where wheels came from in mythology. They were originally the gold wheel dancers became the first wheels and they're in honor of them. So he decided that, that one day when he was praying to the wheels, that, that it activated one of the gold wheels, that one of the wheels was actually a gold wheel dancer of his 40,000, and it popped into existence and his old oh, bless you, my son, then it went away. And then from then on, he was always gonna worship the wheels because he's all a gold wheel dancer. So then, like a few years later, we're making up the campaigns for um, River Cradles, and I forget who it was, Greg or something. They said, hey, let's have one more giant cradle come down because the, you know, and then we said, why is there a giant cradle now? And that's why when you go aboard the cradle, there's a gold wheel dancer. And so the, and the idea is that the cradle needs a gold wheel, wheel dancer to like pilot it or something, okay? And there hadn't been any. But Erd prayed to the gold wheel dancer and brought back one, so the giant sent another cradle. And so that's, that was kind of the stimulation of the whole story. That, uh, and it came back to Herb the Ugly's character, you know. So Ken Coffer, he was dead by then, but Ken, Coffer, Ken wasn't dead, the character was. Mm -hmm. So he loved the Gold Wheel Dancer. It goes back to the campaign. It gives a reason for it, but other people can now try to go find the Gold Wheel Dancers. Um, and it was all a, uh, you know. And of course, the Cradle scenario is, is like this fun scenario. Anyway, 
And it all came out of this campaign thing and the desire to do cool things. So there it is. Out of the blue, there's a giant cradle in the major part of Atlanta. But it's because of something in the historical back that was around. You know, um, For example, we have god warriors in the olden days who are all transformed or destroyed. Well, you can meet some of those transformed or destroyed god warriors you know, in, in the way they are. You've met some of them. You know, um, and they're trapped and imprisoned and their spells don't work, but they're still there and you meet the guardians. And you can take anything from the past or the future or, or just take living characters, you know, um, like what happens if our breath, dragon spear, is, is poisoned and dies? Okay, and your players are like, what are we gonna do? We need our breath to lead the people. So, like, they think of the play, yeah, this is, so let's make a fake art graph to lead up, like in the, like in the movie the, uh, the Shadow Warrior by Akira Kurosawa. You know, if you've ever seen that, where the guy fakes being the Emperor. Well, that, well, there's no reason that the art graph of the Dragon Wars has to be the original. Maybe he is a fake. And so the players doing this, they're like, he's a fake. But then eventually, maybe they like they don't want to be a fake, so they have to go on that light and they're supposed to bring him back. Then that's fun too. But but the players are first. How can you kill our graph? Game Master, that's horrible. And he says, well, you know, all you know is there's his corpse with his head missing. You know, because it exploded. And, and the players have to do all this stuff. There's a fake autograph. How do they keep a secret? The Loons is trying to reveal it. Eventually, when they're tough enough, they go on. They, they hear a request to get it back or not. And you have this whole thing, which is based on a really fundamental part of Grantha that you, the Game Master, have changed. And the players have more fun because of it. Another really important thing about playing a character in Glorantha is you start off with all these kind of character types. Humati do this, Humalians do that, or Maldi do this other thing. But all of the greatest people in Glorantha are rule breakers. Herrick, Jariel, Argraf, right? They go around breaking all of those tropes. So, so should the player characters. Yeah. Well, we had a campaign, for example, where one of the players was going to be a Storval, and he had this really crappy strength and, and health and we said, yeah, well, his parents are Stormbull, so he kind of had to go into the cult. He's this, like, weedy, weak Stormbull. But he's like, but I'm a Stormbull. So he was, like, the worst Stormbull. But why wouldn't there be Stormbulls like that? Wasn't that... Was, was Paul Price, Price? Didn't he come back from death three times? Yes. No, no. Oh, uh, no, he wanted to be a Stormbull, I think. It was another one. It was Frank, one of Frank's Mikey characters. You know, Frank's guy never lasts more than a few adventures. But he's the longest-lasting character was Blackbeak. Oh, and we had other things with that because they, uh, one of the, we actually, one of the characters, he was starting to think of a good thing, he said, why don't you be an awakened herd man? So he was an awakened herd man. And then we had a bull answer thrice. So, so we had a Stormbull character, and he was in some kind of trouble, so he did a, he did a d divine intervention, and it worked. And he was like, oh, cool. You know, and he wasn't a room lord, he just, and it worked. And then um, he did it later on for something else, and it worked. And I said, okay, obviously you're blessed by the bull, and every time you do a Star of Iron Intervention, he's going to answer. And the next time he did it, and it answered, and it took all his power, and he died. So it was actually only bull answers twice before his death, then he became bull answers thrice. Because the third time he killed him. Oh, but, he, but every time he only asked him to win the fight. He never, asked to be he never asked to the, the resurrection. And in fact, when his, when his power went to zero, he got to live for the rest of the fight. And then there's things like we went to a, a place and they found, we know that the, um, that there's, that the white bears are extinct in the right? Herrick wears the hide of the, uh, of the king. So they went to a place and they found the hide of the queen of the white bears. Okay? And then they went up with this thing and they said, hey, we'll give it to the Rathori, who are the bear people. And they went up there with the hide and the bear people said, oh, this is great. Um, oh no, the guy put it, he put it on himself. And it turned inside out, he, was, he became a bear walker. Okay, a white bear walker. And so they went up to the authority and they said, hey, you're the bear queen. He says, oh, I guess, you know. And they said, we gotta get that skin for you. And they offered up all this stuff. And he was like, how are you going to get the skin from me? And they said, well, I'm gonna have to skin you. And so, and so he's like, what? And so, and, and the players talk about this for a long time. Find, we're going to have to skin him, but we'll, we'll, we'll heal you once as we do. <laughs> <laughs> and they ran out of points of healing for one of the arms. 
So one arm just got peeled. Like he lost the arm, but it was like, and it was that was all on them, you know. <laughs> but it was they talked the player into letting himself be skinned alive. So that was a lot of fun. But then the Marthori loved them, and you know they had their they had their uh, the white bear queen, so now they could hibernate again. That was their secret power, the hibernate. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Sandy. That was very entertaining. One hour deep dive into a parenta again. And now Tumi needs the audience to do a little video paper to be able to cut inserts. So 